<laughs> Amen. You enjoy that? Oh, okay. yeah. Well, this time I'm going to ask Brother Greg come. And uh, I know you enjoyed this morning. I'm looking forward to tonight. Uh, but I just praise the Lord for men like Greg um, that would just give their life, spend their life out serving God. And, uh, you know, it's not an easy job doing what he's doing. You know, he, he's out on faith. Trusting God to get the appointments, trusting God to pay his bills. And, uh, you know, I thank God for men like that. Amen. Amen. And uh, he, he loves the Lord, I believe, don't you? Well, I'm going to ask Brother Greg to come on, brother. God bless you, man. Thank you so much for being at God's house. And I won't read the announcements since we had those this morning. So uh, thank you again for being here. And trust God can speak to our hearts together. And uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be with you a few days this week and trust the Lord will speak to us and help us uh, in these days that we're living in. Uh, pray for us. We'll be uh, trying to get on uh, a call with Maui uh, after the service. And uh, we're in the process of trying to work on a load of supplies and, and some work that we want to try to help the folks there with. Uh, coming up in the near future, so we've got uh, we've got a plane reserve that uh, we've got a cargo plane reserve trying to wait on approval uh, to get some things over there and to be able to help the folks there. Uh, one of the churches in Lahaina, uh, that's the community where the fire began and where a lot of those folks were uh, devastated at, and uh, one of the churches there. Uh, Grace Baptist Church, uh, one of the uh, oldest churches on the island, and uh, the pastor there's uh, Dr. Brown, and I talked with him a couple times, and uh, he said all I got out of the house with uh, was my bedroom shoes and my clothes on my back, and he said everything else is gone, mm -hmm. and uh, he lost his house, his son lost his house, all of his staff members lost their house, and about 40 of their members lost their houses. And the uh, church burnt down, church vans, everything's gone. And he said the fire got so hot, he said my Honda Odyssey van was sitting outside the house and literally it melted to the ground. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can imagine the heat oh, and uh, what they're facing and just a difficult situation. And uh, I would love to go over and meet with him and uh, try to do our part as an organization to try to be a blessing and a help to those folks. So you pray that the Lord will work out some major details that need to be worked out. Normally, we're one of the first organizations on the ground, uh, but this is totally different, even though it's part of the United States. Uh, it's almost like going into a, a third world country in a way, uh, all the approvals and all of those things that you gotta have to get in. And uh, so I'm praying the Lord to just work out some major, uh, major victories. And uh, I told the Lord I'm willing and uh, want to do our part. And uh, he just has to work out the rest. So you pray for those folks there. And uh, we've got a, a group of uh, uh, folks that want to go and want to go help uh, for about 10 days over on the island and uh, be a blessing to them. So we're praying about that. And then after Wednesday night, uh, you pray for us. We'll be driving to Georgia uh, Wednesday night after the service. And then we have a youth retreat down at our youth camp right on the Georgia-Florida line. And uh, we'll have that Friday and Saturday. And uh, we've got young folks coming together, uh, multiple churches coming together. And we'll have a service Friday night, a service Saturday. Uh, we'll be feeding them uh, four meals during the day and during that time. And uh, we had a great summer camp year. We had over 100 young folks say uh, in those uh, camp services this year. And we praise God for God's goodness. And that's our uh, camp called Venture of Faith Camp. And uh, you can go to VentureofFaith.org to find out about that. It's uh, celebrating 50 years of ministry. And uh, we purchased that uh, two years ago. Uh, this was our second camp season. And uh, God's blessed in a marvelous way. And I love investing in the next generation. See Amen. God Amen. Uh, working Amen. their lives. We have dozens that surrender their life 
uh, to the service of the Lord, and we praise God for that and the opportunity to meet together with teenagers, with children. Uh, one of our biggest weeks was our junior week, and uh, we had over 220 juniors. And uh, can you imagine uh, dealing with that? That's why a lot of my hair's gone. Can we get an amen on that? And uh, so we had a great time with the juniors and our teens and all of those folks that came together. And then we have a men's retreat that we hold right after Christmas in, in February. And uh, so a lot of different things that we do there with camp property and looking forward to what God has there. Don't forget, go by the table, get the information. There's information about Greg Lynch Ministries. There's information about our disaster relief organization, Hearts with Hands. All of that information is on the table. And then there's a little book back there called Sounds from Heaven. And uh, it's, it's talking about the uh, revival on the Isle of Lewis. And this is, a, this is the account of 1949 to 1952, a three-year span of time. And uh, the uh, gentleman that went there to preach, the evangelist, uh, there was two little ladies in that community called the Smith Sisters. And uh, they were in their 80s. One had crippling arthritis. One was blind from birth. And uh, those two ladies were just great prayer warriors. Mm -hmm. And uh, the parish ministers were discouraged because they didn't have young people coming to the services. So they made a declaration that they put in all the churches on the island. And they said, we need to seek the Lord on behalf of, of the teenagers and the young people that they would come back to church. And uh, the little ladies got all of those parish ministers together in their house. And they said, you've tried everything else, but have you tried the Lord? Mm -hmm. And uh, started, started talking to those parish ministers. And they said, we're going to fast and pray for the next 30 days. And we're going to ask all of you to get your churches together and fast and pray for 30 days. That God would do something miraculous on our island. And uh, they said that the Lord showed us that there'd be a strange evangelist that would come and begin this revival by preaching in all of our churches. And uh, they told those parish ministers, we don't know his name. We don't know what he looks like. And that's not our responsibility. Y'all need to go find him. And can you imagine that? So sure enough, they went to a conference and Duncan Campbell, the evangelist, was preaching. And uh, the Lord showed them he was the one that was supposed to be there. And they went to him after the service and said, would you be able to come at this time frame and come to our island? He said, I can't. I've got a big conference that is in town and I've got hotel rooms booked. I've got all of these people coming and there's no way that I can make it. And uh, we'll try it another time. And they went back and told the two little Smith sisters what he said. And those little Smith sisters didn't, didn't uh, tear them out of the frame. They said, he'll be here before the end of the month. Huh? Amen. And uh, sure enough, a business came in and had a bigger conference, bought all the hotel rooms out from under him. He had to cancel his conference, and sure enough, he was there before the end of the month. And, uh, and God worked out all the details. And uh, they came to the first service, and he got there uh, that evening, and they wasn't planning on having a service. They was just going to have a greeting time with the evangelist and the people. And they got to that service. Well, those parish ministers had got serious with God. And basically, they went out in what they call the barn, and, and they began to pray. And they started praying, and my hands and my heart is dirty. How's the Lord going to hear us? If we're not right with each other and right with God, how's the Lord going to hear us? And they started getting right with the Lord in that barn, and they started coveting together, for I will pour water upon him that is thirsty, and floods upon the dry ground was the verse and the promise that they began to quote. And they were covenant keeping people. They were promised uh, people. They believed the word of God. And so they took God at his word. And so sure enough, the evangelist comes and the building was packed to capacity. And, and uh, he said he addressed the people, welcomed the people, and the people welcomed him. 
and he got down out of the pulpit, started walking to the back, and he said a couple of those parish ministers lifted up their hands and said, God, you promised that you would pour water upon him that is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. And they said as he was walking out the door of the building, you've got to remember this is a farming area and it's uh, very sparse in, in big city life in that day. They didn't have Facebook. They didn't have Instagram. They didn't have X now, not Twitter, X. And uh, they didn't have all of the things that we have in our modern day, but they had God. Amen. And they said it was like the Lord went by houses and started waking these people up. By this time, this was 10 o'clock at night, started waking people up. And you could see them come through the, the, the trees and you could see them coming down the road. And you could see them coming with flashlights in their hand. And they were coming to the house of God. Amen. Nobody, nobody announced it. Nobody talked about it. No way to get them up. No way to tell them. And the evangelist said he walked down the stairwell just like yours at the back of the building, walking down to the bottom part of the building to the road area. And he said people started thronging the house of God and started coming. And they started uh, praying, Lord, save me. Lord, save me. And they started getting saved. And he said he, he went to this uh, church and he went to this church and he went to church. And the same results were happening. People coming out of nowhere, getting saved by the grace of God. And, and they said it was so much convicting power and so many people coming that they even went to the jailhouse because the constable there was a saved man. And a saved judge. And they started going there trying to get people to tell them about Jesus and how to get saved. Can you imagine that kind of problem? Can you imagine that many people coming hungry and thirsty, desiring to be saved? And they said there were so many people coming. And they would have services. And here's what was so unusual. Now, we'd have a heart attack. Here's what was so unusual. They, they met uh, about 8, 9, probably about 9.30 at night. They would break and they would have tea is what they called it. Much like our coffee now, they'd have tea. And then they would go back to church. And they had said that we would go to 1 and 2 and 3 o'clock in the morning services, people getting saved. Amen. And the Lord moved. And uh, wouldn't that be amazing if we could see something like that again Amen. and see the power and the presence of God so real in our communities that people couldn't get away from it. And the Lord would just move on them in such a magnitude they would get saved by the grace of God. So you pray. Uh, we serve the same God, right? Amen. And God said he's no respecter of person. Uh, he just needs some people that get thirsty and hungry for him to do something. And I really believe if the church would get where we're supposed to be, That's right. then we could reach our communities again with the gospel of Jesus Christ and see them saved by the grace of God. Thank you again for being here. And let me mention this, I about forgot. Did anybody bring a visitor with you tonight that wasn't with you this morning? We're gonna start this little competition starting tonight and we'll go all the way through Wednesday night and, uh, and if you brought somebody and you're not ashamed of them, wave at me, okay? And uh, all right, if you brought anybody, anybody, anywhere, anywhere. Okay, so starting tomorrow night, you got to work hard. Right. Bring somebody, call somebody, invite somebody. Take them to eat. There you go. All right, and then bring them to church. And uh, if you've got lost family or friends or acquaintances, you've got folks that are not in church, this will be a great week to ask them to come. And uh, let's pray for them. Let's pray that God would touch them and pray the Lord would speak to them, all right? Amen. And let's see God do something in these few days together. We'll get in it. Uh, we'll get out of it what we get in. That's and right. uh, we'll get out of these services what we put into them. And so I trust we'll do our part and we'll ask the Lord to do His. Revelation chapter number 2. Revelation chapter number 2. Uh, I know this being a, a church where 
like my mom and dad's church, um, they were big on uh, Sunday school. They were big on uh, studies in the Word of God, and I know that your church is the same. Uh, Revelation is a very unusual book. It shouldn't scare us, Amen. okay? It ought to intrigue us yes. because it's showing us what's going to take place in modern time. It shows us it's like un, it's like opening the newspaper and seeing it in our day. And this was written over two thousand years ago, and it's just as prevalent now as it was then. Yeah. And uh, and here John the Beloved is writing in this book under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and it's given to eyes given us through the eyes of this man. John the Beloved. It's the unveiling or the opening up of the divine author, Jesus Christ. I like to say it this way, it's the divine hymn book because it's all about Jesus Amen. Christ. Yes. From the first word to the last word. It reveals to us his person, his purposes, his plans, his power, his promotion. It reveals to us what is going to come to pass. You outline the book of Revelation very simply this way. Revelation 1 is the visions of the things seen of Jesus Christ. And Paul said, I see him as the Alpha and the Omega. Jesus declared, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the ending in chapter number 1. And when John saw him, he said, I fell at his feet as dead, and I began to worship him because I recognize he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And if we could get that close that we could see him, if we could get that close that we could understand him, if we could get that close that we could even hear him, I promise you we would get low that he could get high and he would have the preeminence again at the house of God. In Revelation chapter number 2 and, and verse in chapter 3, is the entirety of the church age. It's the beginning and the ending of the church. It goes through the, all of the perspectives of what the church is going to deal with before the rapture comes to pass. It reveals to us the present in the church. It reveals to us the good, the bad, the ugly. And Jesus begins to describe these seven churches of Asia Minor, giving them a particular time frame and showing them as particular churches in these particular cities and showing us a representation of what we should be and what we shouldn't be for the cause of Christ. It reveals to us the redeeming of the church, the rejection of the church. It reveals the repentance of the church, the revival that comes to a church that gets hungry and thirsty before God. And it reveals to us the rapture of the church when Jesus calls us out of here to be with him throughout all eternity. Revelation 4 and all the way to the end of the chapters of 22, it begins to deal with the judgments and the vials and all of the things that's going to take place and how an unbelieving society is going to experience the wrath of a holy God because of their rejection of who Jesus is. And can you imagine this same Jesus that has shown mercy and grace and kindness that has given his life a ransom for humanity and humanity mocks him and laughs at him and the gangsayers begin to say there is no God and the professors say that you, you are depending on something and someone that is not real and, and one day that every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. And can you imagine the wrath just as Jesus pours out mercy and grace and kindness and one day when the day is over and the day comes that the wrath of Jesus is going to be poured out on an unbelieving society that rejected him, rejected his name and the wrath of God is going to be revealed to a lost and dying world and and they're going to say, 
I wish the mountains would come down upon us. I, I wish I could die, but they can't. Because of the wrath of the judgment of God, because of them saying that there is no God and they don't need Jesus. Can you imagine that day? It reveals to us all of the plans and all of the future and all of the things that's going to come to pass. It can be viewed to us and through these eyes. It can be viewed prophetically because we see what's going to happen. But it can be viewed practically because we understand this is a literal church just as you are a literal church. And we can view what uh, John is writing and what Jesus is telling us through his pen and through his eyes to let us understand if he talked to those churches he needs to speak to us as Amen. well yeah. and if he reprimanded those people he needs to reprimand us that we would fall in love with the son of God again Amen. it can be you personally that every person in this building needs to take a personal a personal account of our life that right. every one of us needs to examine ourselves in the faith and every one of us needs to come to the place where we understand that it's not my brother it's not my sister but it's me oh lord Amen. standing yes. in the need of the lord standing in the need of prayer and it's the times like these and meetings like these that we begin Begin to examine and let the Lord examine us and help us that we would understand we need him again yes. at the house Amen. of God. Amen. And so I don't like uh, doctors who, who in the building just wakes up on Monday morning saying, man, I can't wait to go to the doctor. Uh, see me after the service, okay? Because uh, I don't wake up that way. Uh, I don't like the poking and the prodding. I, I don't like them interrogating my body and, and all of that. But what the doctor is doing, he's trying to find out what's wrong with you. Yeah. He's trying to help you in the end. It may be painful in the middle. It may be painful at the beginning. But in the end, he's trying to make you better. And that's what Jesus is doing. And sometimes the word of God is sharp. And it's a two-edged sword. It begins to deal with our hearts. It begins to bring conviction upon us. It begins to show us where we really are with the Lord. But until that light is shown on us, until that conviction, is brought upon us we will never get where we need to be with the Lord that's right and so what I pray this week the Holy Spirit of God will begin the work inside of us and sometimes that work is hard sometimes that work is painful but let him break up our fallow ground let us get to the place where we love him more than any other thing that we would love Jesus supremely when we walk out of this building this week. Yes. And so here, the Word of God begins to show us, and I want to deal with Revelation chapter number 2 for a moment. You still with me? Uh, all of this is introduction to get to where I'm going. Now, I want you to think about every one of these seven churches of Asia Minor was placed strategically in a city. And Jesus uses that and he places them as the light of that city. Do you understand that your church on the side of this, is it, is it uh, Liberty Hill Church Road or what's the this name? Big Lick, Road. Big Lick Road now up on the other end is Liberty, Liberty Hill, Hill, right? So when you cross the intersection, it comes to Big Lick Church Road and you're supposed to be the light that God put in the middle of this city, this community, that they would see the light of the gospel, right? Amen. And so as people ride by, you're supposed to be that living testimony, that that, that, that witness, that testifier that Jesus is real and Jesus is alive and well. Well, Jesus put all of these seven churches in these particular locations. And to understand his wording, you must understand the setting of those communities. Uh, when you look at this, Ephesus was an important city commercially. It was noted for its magnificent harbor. The ships came from all over the known world to bring their goods and their wealth to Ephesus. 
Now notice this, it was an important, uh, an important city politically. Not only commercially did they see the, the blessing of people coming, but politically it was known because it was a free city. They practiced self-government. It was not so much under Roman control as it was there in the city, the people and their self-judgment and their self-government. It was known as a religious city. It was the home of the goddess Diana. It was a very pagan city. It was a wicked city. But yet the Bible describes this as one of the churches that Jesus recognized as being one of the strongest churches out of the seven of Asia Minor. Now notice what this church did. Now notice in verse number one, and I'll go to the word of God. And under the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his hand, in his right hand, and walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. That's the church. I know thy works. Now let's stop right there. I may fool you, you may fool me, but the Lord knows our works. Amen. Right? Yeah, that's right? And so when we come to grips with that, that's part of the Holy Spirit working on us because we got to understand and recognize the Lord knows me when I'm here and he knows me when I'm at my house. Right. He knows me on the college campus and he knows me at the workplace. He knows me at school and he knows me in the shopping line when I'm going through Walmart. Yes. Huh? He knows everything about it, every person in this building and we cannot hide from Jesus. Amen. And, and when we understand that, then that helps us to recognize that we need to live for Jesus every day because he knows our works. Yes. It's not a work salvation. No, after my salvation, I want to do something for Christ to honor him, to show my adoration, to show my love, to show my appreciation to him. And the best way I can do that is to serve him and to honor him every day. And so Jesus looks at this church and he says, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou cannot bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say that they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne, and hast patience, and for my name's sake hast labored, and hast not fainted. Now let's take those first three verses. And, and notice the practice of this church. I believe it was a serving church. Because Jesus said, I know thy labor. I, I know for my name's sake, you have labored for me. And, and he commends this church because of their labor. And every person in this building, the reason your church has existed for the years it has is because there's been some people that have carried the load and labored here at this place. And so every person here, uh, we've got to understand there's labor involved at the house of God. There's, there's work to be done at God's house. You, you can't just ask uh, Pastor Jeff to do it all. Amen. Huh? Right. You'll kill him. That's right. Huh? It takes every person in this building doing their part. Amen. It takes every individual doing what they're supposed to do. And, and if we would grasp that at the house of God, it would take a lot of hardship off of God's man where it don't kill him. Huh? And so everybody needs to work together, labor together. And, and the scripture says that Jesus commends them because they were a serving church. But the scripture also says they could not bear them which are evil. They were a separated church. They didn't want false doctrine inside of the house of God. They, they didn't want things to come in that would take away the glory of God inside of the house of God and that's the reason we ought to be protective in these last days not every sound, not every wind of doctrine should come in we should stay firmly planted upon the word of God because it is ever alive and it's ever true and if I'll stand upon it and stand with it then God will bless me the rest of my days upon this earth right. separated yeah. church it was not only a serving church and a separate, it was a sound church they, they found false doctrine inside of the people and they exposed it. 
And sometimes that is tough. Yes. Sometimes that is hard. Sometimes that is difficult. But if you let every wind of doctrine come in besides the mercy and the grace of God and what Jesus has done, and you take away the preeminence of the Lamb of God at the house of God and make it about personalities and about people instead of the person of Jesus Christ, then the church will begin to crumble and die right before your very eyes. Amen. And so it was a sound church. But it was a steadfast church. They, they, it said Jesus said they didn't faint, they didn't quit, they didn't throw in their spiritual towel. They kept the faith in their day. And may God challenge us in this day of adversity that we stand firm on the truth and we stand firm in the gospel and we love Jesus yes. with all of our heart. Amen. And if there was ever a church in all of these seven that you would want to be a part of, it was the church at Ephesus. And, and Jesus looks at them and he makes this next statement in verse number four. Nevertheless, and any time Jesus stops all the wording and says, nevertheless, I need to pay attention. Amen. Right. Amen. Something is about to happen. Something is about to take place. He said, nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. You say, what is he saying? I thought he just committed. He did. He said, you've got the right walk, you've got the right talk, you've got the right language. You, you serve me, you try to do right for me, but somehow in the midst of your doing, you've lost your love for me. And a lot of churches are caught up in the doing. A lot of the churches are caught up in the business. A lot of churches are caught up in the things. But somewhere we've lost the all of who Jesus is, and it should be all about him. Amen. And, and, and if I get caught up in doing my routine every day, and I don't love him, then it's tinkling cymbal and brass, and it won't be accomplishing anything for the cause of Christ. I'm committed, and the Lord, the Word of God tells us we ought to commit ourselves to love Christ with all of our hearts. And he said, I, I've got something against you. So you not only see the practice of this church, but now we're going to examine the, the, the problem with the church. Nevertheless, I have someone against you because thou hast left thy first love. Now follow with me. How can a church that's serving, sound, steadfast, standing for Christ, become a church that's lost their first love? It's easy to do. We get distracted. We get involved in our lives. We get involved in the day that we're living and we forget about it should be about Jesus. Right. And we lose that all. Do you, do you remember how it was when he saved you and he changed your life and, and, and no matter if you was the worst person in this community or somebody that sat on this pew, but Jesus changed your life. And he came into your heart, the all that you had for Jesus because you understand that he loved me with an everlasting love and he gave everything for me and I want to love him because he first loved me. But somewhere we get caught up in the business of the day and we just lose our love that we used to have for Jesus. Yeah. Huh? Now here's what this verse says. They left that word left does not mean that they accidentally walked away. That word has the implication that they intentionally walked away. Mm -hmm. That they got to the place that they became successful in their church and, and they saw the Lord bless them, but they got and they came to the place where they literally forgot about Jesus and they thought that they could do it themselves. And we've got churches today that is built on personalities, it's, it's built on people instead of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if those people and those personalities are not there doing the next big thing, that church feels like that it's out of business. When the church should be centered around Christ and the church should be centered around Jesus and the church should be centered around the gospel. 
And here Jesus makes an indictment. He says, nevertheless, I've got something against you because you have intentionally left your first love. Now notice with me, I wrote this down about this church. They left their love for Jesus. They left their love of the cross. They left their relationship that they had with the Savior. Not that Jesus left them, but they left Jesus. And, and so many times we find ourselves in the day that we're living in, especially these last days, and we get comfortable and well-doing, and we just sit down and we take it easy, and we lose that love relationship that we used to have with the Son of God. We used to get up every day and just, just tell them, thank you for what you've done for me. Thank you for a good night's rest. Thank you for giving me another day upon this earth. Help me to live it for you. Help me to honor you. Help me to love you the, this day. And now we just get busy. We go get our coffee. We get in the car. We go to the office or we go to the workplace or we go to the schoolhouse. And we forget that we need to spend time with Jesus. Right. And so here Jesus said, I've got a problem somewhere along the line. You forgot about me. They left the relationship that they used to have with the Savior. They had labor without love. They had works without worship. They had programs without passion. They had services without the Savior. Mm. And, and, and we, we know the bulletin. We know what we're going to do every Sunday. And we know, the, we know the schedule, but I wonder, have we scheduled Jesus out of our services? And so here, Jesus says, I want you to do something. How can I get it fixed? Here's what he does, the prescription. Just like the doctor does when he examines you and maybe your, your bones are aching or your toes hurting or something's messed up in your body and you go to the doctor. He starts the process. He'll take your blood, which I hate. God put it there for a reason. Don't take it out. <laughs> and, and, and you think about, you think about all, I mean, I, I, I've got doctors that are friends of mine. I've got doctors that fly me different places. And, uh, and I love them, but I tell them all the time, I don't like you. <laughs> Because it's painful, right? right? But as they are examining us, they're trying to find out my ailment and my problem. And they want to make it better. They're, they're just not in the doctor's office poking and prodding and saying, hey, I want to see how much I can hurt them today. Huh? <laughs> and Jesus is not up in heaven. I want to see how much I can hurt them today. Right. No, he's trying to show us where we really are with him. He's trying to examine us to let us know, do I really love him like I used to? Do I really serve him like I used to? Do I really honor him like I used to? Or am I just playing the religious game Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday nights? Huh? And there's a lot of people that just go through the mechanics and the motions, and they've lost their love that they used to have for Jesus. Huh? And so he said, what, what, what is the prescription for this church? Notice in verse number five. Remember, the greatest thing that you and I can do tonight is remember Jesus died for you. Yes. Remember Jesus loved you with everything that he had. Remember how much he gave everything for you. Remember, reflect for a moment how good he has been. Amen. Remember all the times that your back was against the wall spiritually and you had no way out. But somewhere in the shadows, the Holy Spirit of God came through in the midnight hour and lifted you and carried you. Or he sent somebody by your way to let you know, hey, I prayed for you tonight. I, I just want to let you know the Lord woke me up to pray for you. And all of those times, we need to remember how good God has been to every person in this building. He's been better to us than we ever deserve. And we ought to praise him. We ought to thank him. We ought to give him adoration. And we ought to, he deserves my ultimate. 
ultimate love Amen. for him. Yes. And he said, the greatest thing that I could do to get it right is start to remember, reflect. Where did I leave him? What did I do? How did I get so involved with this situation or that one that I just left Jesus out and left him standing there by himself? May the Lord help us to remember tonight how good he's been. Right. Nobody's ever loved you like Jesus. Right. Nobody's ever done for you what the Son of God has done. And when you think about laying your head on the pillow tonight, why don't you remember and reflect for a moment, God has been good to me. God has blessed me beyond comprehension. And you ought to be thankful and grateful. Remember God's goodness. He said the thing you need to do is remember. Reflect. Think about. Stand in awe. Remember He loved me. If you would just stop for a moment and just say those words, He loved me. He loved me. Yes. Uh, nobody has ever done that for you. And you ought to come to the place where every day you remember. Now notice what he says. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen. Which means remember where you walked away. Remember how cold you become. Remember the callousness and what it produces in our life. Remember the harshness and the hardness that is producing on our heart when we walk away from Jesus. And he said, remember for a moment how Jesus found you, how Jesus saved you, how Jesus changed you, how Jesus has blessed you, and how good God has been to every person in this building. Notice what he says, remember from where thou art fallen, and the word that we don't like, repent. Yeah. Everybody say that with me. Repent. Yes. That's a word that we don't hear much in our Baptist churches. Amen. Come on now. Say the same thing. But it's something that we need to come to grips with yes. if we're going to see the presence of God back at his house. Amen. If we're going to have a church that is on fire and a church that is alive and a church that is vibrant and a church that is impacting their society, we've got to have a church that is quick to repent. Amen. Yes. And that word repent is the Holy Spirit shows me. Greg, you got busy this week and you forgot about Jesus. Huh? You got distracted this week with all the stuff that's going on and you forgot about me. Why don't you get back in love with me? And I'll work out all the other stuff. Yes. Huh? Why don't you get back in love with me and let me help you through the other things that you're yes. facing. Yeah. And repent. That means that I, I'm going one direction and the Holy Spirit shows me and I turn away from that direction and I come back to Him. Right. Repentance is what needs to happen at the house of God. Yes. We need to come to the grips of repentance. What is it? Repent of our coldness. Repent of our callousness, repent of our complacency, repent of our compromise, repent of the way we have been treating Jesus in these days. And if everybody was honest, the people that we care about on this earth is more precious to us a lot of times than what Jesus is and what he's done for us. And we need to get back in love with him. That's right. And the scripture tells us, repent. And notice what else he says. And do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except, he makes another statement, except thou repent. Mm -hmm. So what's the prescription of our message tonight? Remember? Repent, return. What am I supposed to do? Return to loving Christ. Return to laboring for Christ. Return to listening to Christ. Return to looking for Christ every day that he's coming again. Our anticipation is to spend time with Jesus. And I wonder, have we lost? Has it been because of the distractions the difficulties, the stuff that we're doing and being and going through, or is it because we just intentionally 
walked away. That we left him out of our lives. And if we don't fall back in love with him yes. and return, he gives the ultimate statement, then I'll come and I'll remove the Holy Spirit, which is the candlestick inside of that church, and I'll take the Holy Spirit down the road, out the door, to the next church down the road that wants me, and leave you by yourself. And there's a lot of churches tonight that have been left by themselves because they got so cold that they walked away from their love of Jesus. See, it's not so much about you and me, but it is all about him. Amen. Amen. And we need to love him all the days of our lives. Yes. Nobody has ever done for us what Jesus has done. And all he asks us to do in these last days is to love him. Amen. And guess what? If I love him, I don't have to worry about what you're going to do tomorrow. Right. If I love him, I don't have to worry about tomorrow night. I'm going to be here. If I love him, I don't have to worry about next week. What am I going to do in a situation when somebody brings temptation in my path? I'm going to abstain from that. I'm going to love Jesus. I want to honor him because I don't want to hurt the heart of Jesus Amen. and ruin my testimony and my relationship with him. Right. And so every person in this building, I wonder tonight, would we let the Holy Spirit examine us? Have we left our first love? The first step of revival is the church get honest with itself, yes. honest with God, and honest with each other, that we begin to recognize it's not my brother, my sister, it's me. Amen. It's me, Lord. I need revival. Yes. I need to fall back in love with you. I need your presence and power. And what would happen tonight if we, as a congregation, would fall in love with Jesus. This community could not contain, That's right. just like that community could not contain the presence of Jesus that started permeating from those four walls. As people started loving each other, loving their community, and loving lost people, and watching their friends and their family and acquaintances be saved by the grace of God. The most important thing is Jesus yes. being the main thing at the house of God. That's right. Amen. May I and you and we love him with all of our hearts. I want us to stand all over the building tonight. Thank you so very much. When you look at this church, <coughs> He said the last indictment is I'm going to remove. I'm going to remove my presence, my power, my promises, his purpose. He's going to take it down the road to the next church that wants him. Let's don't let that happen at Big League. Let's don't let the Lord leave this place. Let's say, Lord, we can't have church without you. Amen. That's right. We can't sing without you. We can't teach a class without you. We can't preach without you. All we would be is, is, is sounding brass and tinkling cymbal. It won't get higher than the ceiling. But if all, oh, if we could beg and ask the Lord's presence to permeate this place, what would happen in the next few hours if we would just fall in love with Jesus and say, Lord, for the next few days, I want to spend time reflecting and remembering how good you've been to me. Amen. Have you ever been down in the dumps? Be honest, wave at me. Yes. <laughs> and you know the best way out of that is start remembering how good God's been and how he's That's brought right. you through yes. and what he's done for you in the past he's able to do now. Yeah. And, and you'll notice something. You, you, start, you start remembering, you start reflecting, and then all of a sudden you start thinking of somebody else that's worse off than me. Yeah. And I start praying for them, and all of a sudden through this, I'm getting lifted up the whole time out of what I'm walking in because I'm focusing in on Jesus right. and watching him work in my life. 
I believe the reason that we stay so discouraged and defeated is because we've lost our first love with Jesus. Mm -hmm. And I can't be defeated when I look at who he is and what he's done. And I understand and comprehend how much he's done for us. How can I be defeated in him, the one that has given victory for time and for eternity for every person inside of this building? Yeah. May I love him. How many would be honest tonight? And, and I'm not going to ask you to bow your head. I'm not going to ask you to close your eyes. I want to ask you this question. How many would be honest? I need to love him more than I ever have. Would you just wave Amen. at me? Amen. I want to love him more. Then right. I want you to spend a moment. This altar's open, and if you can't come, you can stand. If you can't stand, you can sit on these front pews. But, but I want us to make some movement forward yeah. toward Christ and say tonight, Lord, I want to love you. I want to love you. I want to go away from this building tonight. I want to love you. I want my family to see me loving you. I, I want my friends to see me in love with you. I want, my, I want my fellow classmates to see me in love with Christ. I, I want my work people to see me in love with Christ. I don't want them to hear me talk about the dirty stuff that they're talking about. I want them to see me telling them about Jesus and he saved me and he changed my life and he made everything brand new. I want them to see a love relationship inside of us. Don't be like there was a man that I had in our church. I was youth pastor for four and a half years in Mount Airy, North Carolina. And we went to their house one day and, and uh, he, he said, I told my wife when I married her that I loved her. And if I changed my mind, I'd let her know. Huh? He never cultivated that relationship. You know what I'm saying? Huh? We need to cultivate our relationship with Christ. We That's need right. to love him with all of our hearts. Yes. We need to spend time with him. Maybe y'all can come and get a song of invitation. And, and would you take a moment tonight and would you find you a place, whether it be in that seat where you're at, whether it be in that pew where you're at, or whether it be up here, but you take a moment and just start remembering and reflecting God truly has been good to me. And I need to love him more than I ever have. And how many, how many, how many would just be honest with me? And we're just honest with each other. We're, we're, we're family. And we're just honest. Man, there's been some days I didn't love him. Absolutely. Huh? There's been some times that I, I, I intentionally walked away from him. Huh? Just like, just like what he said to this church. So may I and you and we fall back in love with Jesus. And if we'll do that, it will change the ministry of Big Lake Baptist Church until Jesus comes. Yes. If we would love him with all of our hearts. Yes. Father, for the next few moments, Lord, I pray that you would show us, examine us, help us to realize and recognize where we are with you. And Lord, help some people inside of this place just to get honest with their self tonight and honest with you. Yes. And say, Lord, I need to fall back in love with you because I've walked away and I've left my first love. And Lord, help us to be honest. Help us to do that. And then Lord, help us in the days to come, the hours to come, to let your love permeate our lives that people around us will say, sirs, you have been with Jesus. Yes. And we'll give you praise and glory in Jesus' name. She's going to sing, and you just mind the Lord. They're going to play and sing. And, and if you want to come, this altar's open for all of us. Amen. And maybe you want to come and just say tonight, Lord, I need to spend some time with you. I need to love you more than I ever have. You just mind God. Him number 
close for just a moment while these are praying and continue to play. Would there be one in the building tonight that would just be honest, preacher? I thought about it a lot when I lay my head on the pillow at night. I just wonder, where would I spend eternity? Would I go to heaven? Would I go to hell? What would be my life after this one's over? And tonight the Holy Spirit has spoken to you. And he has shown you that Jesus loves you more than you could ever imagine. He died for you. He shed his blood for you. He gave his life for you. And all he asks you to do is to say yes to him and let him change your life and forgive you of all of your sin. Will there be one in the building somewhere that would just be honest? Preacher, I'm not sure that I'm a Christian. I'm not sure there's ever been a time and a place where I've ever asked Jesus to come into my heart and to change my life and to save me and to make heaven my home. And I want you to pray for me. Would there be one anywhere to slip that hand up and say, Preacher, pray for me. Pray for me. Pray for me. Anybody anywhere? Anyone anywhere? Pray for me. Pray for me. I'm not sure that I'm a Christian. I'm not sure that I'm a Christian. How many would be honest, preacher? I'm a Christian, but I've got to be honest. I know that I'm not walking with Christ. And the Lord has spoken to me tonight. Pray for me. But there be somebody that's lift that hand up in the building and say, Preacher, pray for me. Pray for me. Pray for me. Pray for me. She's going to sing one last verse. You just mind the Lord as she sings. sing that song there, wherever he leads, I'll go. You know, many times as I've said here as your pastor, we sung that song. I couldn't help but to think, do we really mean it? Do we really mean what we sing? Wherever he leads, I'll go. You know, this message that he preached to us tonight about falling in love with Jesus. You know, many times people have spoken to me and said, preacher, why don't why don't they come? Why don't, why don't people get involved? Why don't this? Why don't that? So many times it's been on the end of my tongue, Brother Greg, mm -hmm. that I wanted to say it's because they don't love Jesus yeah. like they should. Yeah. My wife and I were riding today, and we were talking about people we invited to come, people who are part of the church. And I just told her, I said, you know, until they get, really get Jesus in their heart, Nothing's going to change. Right. And if, if you don't want to change your life, then don't go after Jesus, I'll tell you that. But if you're getting tired of the way you're living, you're getting tired of not having that joy and satisfaction in your heart that only can come through a personal, involved relationship with Jesus, then you're going to have to make the step forward. He's there open arms. Yeah. He's there waiting. And you see, if we're going to have revival at Big Lick, and I want revival, I want things stirred again. I want to see people come with a smile on their face, ready to worship God. People excited about serving God. That's where we got to get back to. But you know what? It has to start with our, our relationship with Jesus. Yeah. That's where it's got to start. And I can't fix your relationship with Jesus. I can preach message after message. I can talk to you, I can ask you to be a part, I can invite you, but it's not going to make any difference, not at all, until you get that right relationship with Jesus. Yeah. And I can promise you this, 
He wants that relationship <laughs> with you. He wants it. Thank you. He loved you enough to save you. He loves you enough that he wants that continuous, cultivated relationship that he talked about. Thank you. Church, please pray. Yes. Please invite. And let me tell you where to start inviting. Look at the church roll. Call up your family. Call up your friends that's part of the church. Because I've already said, Brother Greg, we can't have revival if the church don't come. Right. That's right. Yep. If the church don't come. Invite. Analyze your heart. Where are you? How's your relationship? I can preach, Brother Greg. He's going to come back and preach three more nights. Won't make a bit of difference if you're not opening up your heart to Jesus. None at all. But I'm praying for a real life. I love you, church. You know I do. Hey. I love you. And I think sometimes you love me too. <laughs> With all seriousness, though, let's pray for revival. I want to see it. I want to see things change in our community. You know, nothing's going to change until it starts in the church. We can right. sit and grumble about what's going on in the world, but it ain't going to change anything until it starts changing. We start changing. Yeah. We clean up our closet. We clean up our closet. And brother, he was talking about that revival and those priests getting with God and cleaning themselves up. Yeah, they have to. I, I continuously ask God to forgive me, but you know, I, I've been reading about revivals, and that's where it starts. You see, nothing's going to happen to we clean up our life. Nothing spiritual is going to happen in your life till you come face to face with God and the reality of the life that you're living. Say, God, this is where I'm at. Yeah. Show me where I need to change. Yes. Show me what's wrong. Show me. I love you, church. Anybody have anything they'd like to share before we dismiss? Brother Greg, if you'll make your way to the back, I'm not going to keep you any longer. Please, we got three more nights, 7 o'clock. And Greg's just going to come and give you the word. Amen. He's not going to keep you any longer than the Lord wants him to. Amen. He's not like Pharaoh. He'll let you go. <laughs> yeah, I think I'd like to say something. Though. You, you know, we don't have total recall. You know, it, the, 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 the pit that he brought me out of with my drinking and drugging to where I am today, a family member in this church that today just... I can't describe how much it touches me to spend time with y'all. I heard this this week. You know, Greg was talking about in early service. You know, going through the storms. Okay? You know, we everybody's going through something different. You know, we read this book. And, and do the pages come alive to you or is it just text that you're reading? Job lost his family. He lost all his livestock. Lost his houses. But there was a conversation that took place before all that happened. Maybe your names come up in conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else? I was just going to share that um, just like uh, in the Church of Ephesus, you know, Paul bragged on them in the New Testament about their love and how much they loved. And now they're, now they're at this point where they're busy in the busyness. And I had got that way in my own life before. It was like a checkbox every day. Devotion, check. Call a check on somebody, check. Send a card, check. I was doing all the right things, but the Lord said, but you're forgetting me. And he renewed me and showed me where I've been left, left me leaving him out. And so when we started coming to church here, it was like a whole different perspective. And I remember I had made up my mind because I was wearing so many hats in the previous church I was in that I was wore out. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to serve me anymore. So I'm not doing it. We came for a couple of years, and I remember you kept saying over and over, we need one more teacher. We need one more. And the whole time the Lord was like, that's you. <laughs> He's talking to you. And I kept saying, no, I'm not, Lord, because I didn't want to lose the reason why I was serving. And I did it anyway, so I've been doing it ever since. But I just want to say, just like this church, I got so busy in the doing that I had forgot yeah. the first love. Do the call you love, right? That's right. Amen. Anybody else? All right. Set the heart set aside again. Revive with me. <clears throat> Our Father in heaven, we do thank you, Lord, for this.
this day. Father, we thank you for your many blessings, most of all our salvation. God, you are so good. I don't understand why you saved me. I don't understand to this day. But Lord, you reached down one time a long time ago to look at the church and reached down and touched my life and changed me, Lord. And I'm so thankful. But God, right now, Lord, I just want to love you with all my heart. Father, I want to keep my focus on you always, dear God. I want to serve you to the best I can, Lord. And Father, I may let people down, but the last thing I want to do is let you down. Lord, I love you, and I thank you, and I pray for this church. Lord, this is your church. It ain't mine. Lord, I stake no claim here. It's all yours, Lord. And I just pray that you'll deal with the hearts here. Lord, that you'll move upon the people, Lord. They will seek you, Father, with all their heart. And love you, Lord, with all their heart, dear God. Lord, that's the main thing. Bless us now as we part this way. Keep us safe on the highways. Bring us back tomorrow. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.